The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Welcome into my state of mind on this Thursday evening. Thanks very much uh, for joining us. Law enforcement has a specific role to play in everyday life in our society, but it is uniquely impacted by the coronavirus right now. And we have gone through various stages of law enforcement's adapting to what's out there, the challenges that are out there and the protections that are necessary. So tonight we will have the executive director of the Rhode Island Police Chiefs Association to talk to us about what the concerns have been and what the progress has been for things like testing. The train moved kind of slowly at the beginning for the police officers in this state for testing to know whether they're positive or not. A lot of guesswork going on out there. And uh, I think the general public wants to know and wants to consider police, police officers, firefighters and the like, um, wants to know that they are first responders and that they're being considered as such. And so there's been a little bit of a trail to get there, but we've uh, arrived. And then there are the challenges of police unions in this state, only a couple so far, but a sentiment that we really don't want to be chop busters on this whole situation. And where's that rub between what law enforcement management and law enforcement rank and file think and operate, how they operate uh, on our streets uh, with this COVID-19? virus, you know, mask enforcement, for instance. So those kinds of issues and more coming up in just a couple of minutes with the Police Chiefs Association Executive Director, Sid Wardell, on My State of Mind. Stay tuned. It's an interesting conversation. My State of Mind, Dan York, with the Executive Director of the Rhode Island Police Chiefs Association, Chief Sid Wardell. Uh, Chief, appreciate you joining me here. It has been quite a time without us getting into specifics, just how are you doing and how are law enforcement doing in general, do you think? Well, Dan, good to be back with you. Uh, uh, personally, I'm doing well. Uh, family's uh, healthy and well, so that's the first priority. Uh, second thing is uh, we're working, you know, as the chiefs, uh, trying to help out our first responders and uh, working with all the stakeholders to, uh, uh, you know, do our best for the public. So the, uh, the, the overall uh, reaction to the virus in terms of how you know law enforcement from a management and, and, and rank and file perspective uh, we'll, we'll get into the the, the friction that that is that has gone on here uh, but where were you so to speak you know where were you when all of a sudden you realized everything is changing do you remember yeah i mean uh just crazy as it would be i was one of those that had just gotten back from a cruise uh, just gotten back from new orleans and uh when things started to ramp up uh, luckily i had been there just prior but uh you know it was one of those things that i was uh, working at a meeting in in providence with some chiefs and the conversation sort of came up of you know this is what's happening and what we're hearing about so uh, that was my first, uh, you know, really uh, hearing about it. And then, uh, you know, over those next couple of weeks, it was, boy, we really got to start thinking about what happens when it comes here to Rhode Island. Yeah. In, in, in general terms, what policing procedures, if any, were considered and then implemented? So I think the, the first conversation was really about what do we need to do to protect our first responders? So that brings in the PPEs, you know, asking departments, what do you have? Uh, most agencies, uh, their protective equipment for sort of uh, anything could happen really is a duffel bag in their cruiser, which may have a Tyvek suit and rubber gloves and a face mask. Um, you know, whether it be a crime scene or something which is usually, you know, more apt to be. Uh, and what we really found was, you know, we were uh, highly uh, unprepared uh, for something that was, you know, uh, going to be an extended amount of time, you know, talking about, I mean, we're talking now months. I mean, even at that time, we were talking what happens if this goes a few weeks. Um, so that was that's really probably where our first area of looking into it and really realizing that you know we were certainly well uh, way underprepared. 
I mean, you guys go to a lot of seminars and you're always reviewing uh, criminal justice approaches and standards and law enforcement practices and all of that. In, 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 uh, do you, do you remember any conversation about pandemic preparedness or anything on that line? Yeah, so I mean, I, you know, we can go back. What happens is it, it happens over time. And one of the things that happened really what we got talking about conversations was back when AIDS, and it, that was around and, you know, how did you prepare? And then, you know, uh, a few years back when different uh, diseases were heard about. So that, that was, it would be the topic of conversation. But over time, we you know we get complacent and then we move on from there and unfortunately the same thing happened here and and by no means prepared for you know countrywide pandemic worldwide pandemic but you know the reality of what happens in your own backyard um that's when it hits home is when you really realize that you know individually we're not prepared yeah so how would you uh, i want to talk about some of the testing progress because we originally were on the radio a couple of weeks ago and the police Chiefs association had organized uh some testing for rank and file and then there was some progression uh on that we'll get to that in a moment but uh, you know overall what is the health and welfare comfort zone for lack of better question or term uh with rank and file police officers out there right now what are, what are the uh, feeding back right so I think I mean the rank and file piece to it as far as protection and equipment um, you know our first responders whether it be police fire or EMS and I'm certainly not speaking for them I can speak on the police side um, but you know we recognize the pecking order and we re we recognize where uh, our first um, people aren't really on the front line of the doctor and nurses so you know, we sort of, do we have all the equipment? And I guess what I'm referring to is when we first started is, you know, did we have all the equipment we want uh, or thought we needed, but recognize that the doctors and nurses need that first? I think we're in a place now that we're much better, um, but we're still, uh, the idea that, you know, a, a, a mask, like an N95 mask, which is, you know, sort of the preferred thing, um, those are in short supply. There's not an officer wearing one of those to every call that they go to. Um, so, you know, should we be at that level when there's, you know, especially when there's some known people that are, have the disease that you're going to? Uh, but the reality is we don't really have that. But so I think the comfort level is there that they know we're trying. They know they have a decent amount of equipment. Uh, but how long will that last? I'm not sure. I know EMA is trying to get another month's supply out to us. Uh, but, you know, as we had done uh, that I had sent you the press conference on or press release, you know, we had to go out and seek that out and do it ourselves. That's not a complaint. That's a reality, you know. When we come back, we'll talk about that reality. And then we'll also talk a little bit about uh, some of the predictable tension uh, that police officers have in terms of enforcing some of the, uh, the state mandates right now from the governor's office. Sid Wardell, Rhode Island Police Youth Association. We'll be right back on the New York State Police News. On my state of mind with the Rhode Island Police Chiefs Association Executive Director, Executive Director uh, Chief Sid Wardell. Uh, Chief, the the comfort zone of, of officers has got to be enhanced by information knowledge. As I've said on on this show and on the radio show, you know I'm looking for an antibody test. I I don't I don't know whether that bug and fever that I had in March was COVID-19 or just a seasonal flu. Uh, so eventually, you know, I hope to get one, but I'm, I'm not on the priority list and I want to get the right one, right? So we, we want our police officers to be considered on a priority list and we want them to get the right one. Firefighters too, uh, all of them who are, are challenged here. You've gone through some progression here in terms of testing. Uh, talk to me about it. So, uh, yeah, Dan, that's, you know, that's the, the uh, highlight for everybody is that I have uh, the virus and, uh, and and how would I know? So with our first responders, one of the things that was an issue early on was uh, finding out who did have the COVID virus. And, you know, there's a lot of that's protected by HIPAA. Uh, 
but uh, we worked with the Department of Health in trying to get that information because uh, mainly because there was such a lack of PPE. So you couldn't go with a full Tyvek suit to every call. You had to use it priority wise. So that then led to us trying to make determination with our officers if you came in contact, um, how could we get them tested? Because at the end of the day, those officers go back home to their families. Uh, and then the next day they come back to their other family, right? Which is back to work, which is different officers. So we, we recognized early that we needed to have the ability to get them tested. And I will tell you that was uh, it was frustrating that we couldn't get them uh, priority testing. And I don't mean, you know, just, hey, somebody feels like going, can we get them tested? It was priority testing uh, based on the fact that, you know, and as we've learned more now, somebody being symptomatic, but having had a contact with somebody that was a known positive. So there was frustration there. And, and we, the public had the same frustration, but, the officers don't have the ability to stay home, right? We can't just quarantine law enforcement or any of the first responders. So we've got to make them available to come back to work as soon as possible. If every agency uh, had an individual that, that came down with COVID and it spread throughout the agency, at some point, we're not going to have anybody left on the law enforcement side to, uh, to do those duties. So over time, we were uh, we were able to get uh, some vendors that would assist us. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we didn't get that in Rhode Island. At first, it was in Massachusetts. We would get those tests done. Uh, then we were able to participate at the CVS site, uh, but then there was an overrun there with healthcare workers, so that shut down. Uh, and then most recently, uh, we had come up with a partnership with uh, Ocean State Health to, you know, do priority testing on them. And that priority is not just getting them in, but getting those results. Because if somebody was negative, it was then the ability to get that individual back on the road. Right. Uh, or get let them back to their family, right? And that, that's the scary part. You know, it's bad enough what they do uh, every day incidents, but bringing them back, uh, bringing that uh, infection back to their home, you know, is a real concern. So right now, you, you have priority testing, and interestingly enough, uh, you know, everybody can get tested now, whether they got symptoms or not. Is it mandatory or is it optional? It's all optional. Um, yeah, and what we do have now is the uh, Department of Health, uh, the governor's office has made available any police officer that wishes to get tested can get tested. So that's, uh, so that's sort of, I guess, the fourth rung in the ladder where we've come from and where we are now uh, in doing that, uh, in doing that testing. So the, the, how is the curiosity factor? What percentage of officers uh, or do you know, uh, have taken advantage of, of wanting to get tested? So I know uh, we have about, we use the number of about 7,000 first responders in the state of Rhode Island. That's police, fire, and EMS. We have about 2,600 law enforcement, all law enforcement. Uh, I don't have a breakdown on who has taken advantage by, uh, you know, by discipline. But I do know that it, there's been about 750 first responders that have taken the advantage of going to get testing over the last week on that priority testing. So that doesn't take into account somebody that may have gone to a doctor three weeks ago, got testing on their own. I have, I have no way of knowing those numbers, uh, nor do I know how many have actually tested positive based on this, uh, this uh, ability just to go get tested. Okay, well, that, uh, that's fascinating. Of course, the, the antibody testing is, is everybody in the country wants on a regular basis because it's not just do I have it now or did I bump into somebody in the last week or two that caused it or is this cough or this fever or whatever, you know, is it the allergies? It's also did I have it, you know, because we don't know exactly what the immunity factor is. We hope that it actually is in place, but that's the one that we're all looking for, police officers or not, right, on a, on a widespread basis. Right. And, and, you know, unfortunately, just because you had it, uh, we don't know how long that immunity is, right? So this is a, you know, week by week, almost day by day, we're learning things new about this. So, uh, but definitely by by means of having people come back to work, 
uh, knowing that their immunity may be at a higher level, you know, has its advantages. Again, when we're in a 24-7 uh, type of uh, discipline here and providing for the public, we've got to do anything we can to make sure that they're both healthy uh, but uh, capable to come back to work. So when we come back, we're going to uh, speak to the executive director of the Rhode Island Police Chiefs Association about some of the challenges from a management to rank and file point of view when some officers say, you know what, I don't like what I have to do out there. I don't want to cite anybody. Uh, you know, people make their own decisions about masks at all. Stay with us. We'll be right back on the news.